Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Cisco Chat Live. My name is Nish Parker and I work as a communications manager here at Cisco Secure and I'm also the moderator and host of today's Cisco Chat Live, so welcome. So today we are going to be talking about some of the world's most common network security challenges and how the Cisco network security vision that we introduced at last month's RSA conference is going to help put, put into practice by some of the world's best uh, network security practitioners. Now we want to make sure that this session remains interactive, so please do post your questions in the comments if you're watching on Cisco.com, LinkedIn, YouTube or Facebook. And please remember to use hashtag Cisco chat on Twitter as well. Now I have the honour of introducing our two lovely guests here today. First joining me is Valter Hendricks. Valter is the security lead of Avix Group and is also a Cisco Gateway Cybersecurity Ambassador. Really excited to have you with us Valter, how are you doing? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. Great, thanks Valta. And also joining me is Bill Maven. Bill is the Senior Manager of Network and Application Security Products here at Cisco. So Bill, love working with you every day and welcome as well to the Cisco Chat. How are you doing? Good, thank you Nish. Hi Walter. Great, so before we get started, we asked everyone on social media the following question. We wanted to know in your dynamic application environments, what is your number one security pain point? Now the results were super interesting and there was a three-way tie. The first was enabling micro-segmentation and I know we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Firewall misconfiguration was the second and the third was teams working in silos. But what was interesting is that all of the above was not too far behind. So it's really clear that dynamic, rapidly changing application environments are the norm today. And so we always hear customers telling us that there's a chasm between network security and applications teams, and that their network security posture is also challenged by a lack of visibility and poor integrations. And so that's exactly what we're going to be talking about and deep diving into today, and how we can make some progress together in this area. So Bill, I'm going to start with you. Um, the challenges that the team and, and everyone has shared with us on social media Tell us what you're hearing from your customers. Um, I know you meet with them on a daily basis as well. What's been top of mind for customers when it comes to these challenges? Thank you, Nish. We, we definitely are seeing, uh, with what you described with this chasm between network security and the application team or DevOps, a lot of it's really about speed and, and how quickly can the, the firewall and the network security team actually start responding in a very dynamic application environment that sometimes is changing, you know, whether it's a weekly, daily, sometimes even hourly basis, really, really, really uh, uh, dynamic application environments that our customers are operating in. So that's that's definitely a, one key challenge. And our network, and this is sort of with a you know big W, capital W R K. It's not just about workload and micro segmentation integration with firewall but more broadly this vision that we have is really about being able to translate the customer's intent into action so what customers are saying to us is hey you know this is just too complex right we've got really really smart people on our team uh and they're running flat out you know like uh, uh the australians uh they talk about how they, um, you know, they are uh, like like a uh, you know like a like a lizard drinking in terms of how quickly they're running. Uh, that's one of their their pet phrases. But they're <laughs> they're running flat out, and still uh, they're seeing things like uh, firewall misconfiguration, which is not not a result of really mistakes that are being made, but just that they can't keep up with the pace of change in the application environment, uh, because you know trying to use as a band-aid tools that weren't meant to, to originally operate to protect application environments, they're telling us that's not working, right? Which is why we've invested very heavily in this integration of our application micro-segmentation capability with our larger firewall capability. So that's one area. A second area where customers are telling us they, they are continually challenged is really in, in the realm of visibility. And it's it's not just that 90 plus percent of internet traffic is now encrypted. It's that they have 
challenges with TLS 1.3. They have challenges with certificate pinning on applications or uh, DNS over HTTPS, which is all uh, compromising the visibility that they were, you know, we were all sort of taking for granted seven or eight years ago. Um, um, and, and, and that's a key challenge as well. The, th the third area is really uh, customers looking for more integration. And, and again, this is harking back to simplicity. So uh, uh, the need for uh, uh, cost effective integration, uh, which we've, we've taken deeper in, in some, of, some of our recent work as well. Uh, both with Cisco SecureX and with um, this integration of our secure workload and secure firewall capabilities together. Great. Thank you, Val. Some great insights there on what we're doing right with Cisco Secure. And then, Valter, I'd love to come to you um, and bring it to life, your organization, Avix Group, right? So, Avix Group, uh, they provide uh, strategic security advisory and security managed services to organizations. So, from your first-hand experience, can you share some insights and comment on some of the challenges in locking down application environments? You know, Bill talked about the loss of visibility and then obviously integration as well. Would love to hear your, your perspective. Yeah, well, I, I fully agree, agree with Bill's uh, assessment here that one of the biggest challenges in locking down an application environment is the difficulty in keeping your rule set up to date. It has, it has two negative results. With an out of date rule sets, you're either blocking legitimate traffic or you're allowing traffic which should not be allowed. And for a security team, it's nearly impossible to know with absolute certainty that you have the correct rule sets. Um, loss of visibility means the risk for your environment is increasing. You cannot reliably protect an environment if you cannot see what's happening within that environment. And as Bill mentioned, one of the main causes of loss of visibility, increased use of TLS encrypted traffic, and specifically TLS 1.3 is having a big impact on how easy it is to look into encrypted uh, traffic. The security integration challenge is present with many different products as they simply don't, don't work together. You have to configure every device separately. And if you're investigating some activity, you'll have to manually correlate events between different logs, date, uh, dashboards, or consoles. It really hampers your effectiveness in managing and protecting your environment. Absolutely. We talk, We always talk about, and Bill, this will sound familiar to you, a security solution should always work as a team, right? So I love what you said there on the be, being integrated um, to get most out of the solutions as well. Um, now, Bill, let's talk a little bit about some of the data points. And I know recently Cisco co-sponsored a cloud native study, a security study, sorry, surveying nearly 500 IT and security leaders. Um, all of these organizations had at least $250 million in revenue. Um, and I know we've got some really interesting results out of that. So, Bill, can you share with us what you personally learned from this study? Kind of summarize, and then how is this relevant to you know network security and what we're discussing today? Yeah, right on, Nish. This this study uh, was really focused on organizations that have modern application environments with microservices. Um, uh, we asked, you know, why have you shifted into um, this this kind of application delivery with CI/CD pipelines? And a lot of a lot of the answers there are really, I think, what you'd kind of expect uh, in terms of this is um, uh, a more efficient and cost-effective way to deliver applications. They're much more agile. But what surprised us. Or were two factors. Number one, that 48% of these respondents had said that in their, not their test environments, uh, but in actual production, um, they had had compromises, uh, breaches, uh, and, and actual impact to their business in 48% in of, of those application environments. So I, you know, if I would have guessed, I probably would have thought it's significant, but not roughly half. Uh, and yeah. then the uh, the other finding that that we thought was very interesting uh, was about seventy percent of these respondents uh, noted that they they you know to to the point that Wouter was making they really don't have the the, the level of visibility that they feel they need and um, um, so that's that's just confirmation um, you know that what we're hearing anecdotally. Uh, is a, a very, you know, very quantifiable uh, phenomenon that's going on uh, uh, in the market presently. For sure. And we had um, just last month, 
oh, what was it, a month before? It kind of feels like everything is happening so quickly, right? But we had the RSA conference um, and, you know, to everything we've talked about, we announced the Cisco Network Security Vision, uh, which really emphasizes the ability for NetOps teams to start running at DevOps speeds. I'm sure that's getting a lot of people excited that are listening here today, right? How can we do that? So, Bill, tell us a little bit around how Cisco is making this possible um, for everyone that's listening today. Yes, indeed. So we we have integrated our secure workload and secure firewall product. And you know, speaking of visibility, the secure workload capability, this was formerly called Tetration. Uh, it is monitoring what's happening in an application environment on literally a minute by minute basis. And uh, with that level of visibility, uh, secure workload is, is able now to make policy recommendations to secure firewall. So if you think about um, containing lateral movement and east-west traffic within the application environment using micro-segmentation with secure workload, there, there is now a synchronization between the, uh, the, the policy recommendations that we have on an east-west basis with what the firewall is controlling on a north-south basis. So as, as applications are growing and scaling up, and as, as they have new legitimate needs, secure workload can automatically, this is automated, make policy recommendations that then allows the firewall team to very quickly discover what's, what's going on and to make sure that those changes are, are effectuated in the firewall in a, in a rapid fashion. Um, so that's, that's when we're talking about enabling NetOps to start running at DevOps speed and closing this chasm that you mentioned, that's the, that's the core of this, the visibility that we get from secure workload and how that's informing what's happening for um, secure firewall. Got it. So if I was to be central to that, Cisco vision is comprehensively protecting at the network and the workload level, right, to confidently move faster but while protecting modern application environments. So what I'm hearing, Bill, is this relies on a platform approach. And I know, um, you know, the word platform is being thrown around in the industry quite a lot, but obviously in this case in particular, um, it's particularly critical to making this happen. So explain why a platform approach is necessary, Bill. Yes. So, you know, I, I would say that um, within the security industry uh, as a whole, just as an industry, vendors have for you know the last 30 years been pushing you know the, the the silver bullet du jour right the silver bullet of the day and all you need is this new thing that we've come up with just buy this and every problem that you have magically goes away right so that that magical thinking everybody that's listening to this doesn't live in that world they, they live in the real world right and so we know that you we need different tooling um, you know, um, uh, we need capability at the endpoint as well as in the network. Uh, we need capability that is is really purpose built for micro segmentation uh, as well as for our larger network flows. And and so that's you know that's part and parcel of a platform approach. And you know Cisco takes this so seriously. Um, you know, our nerve center for uh, our platform approach, Cisco SecureX, an entitlement for that is included with every um, Cisco Secure Firewall or Cisco um, Secure Workload capability um, that, that a customer takes. Absolutely. And I know, Bill, um, internally, you know, we've been celebrating a lot because we've just uh, celebrated the one year anniversary of announcing SecureX um, from previous year's RSA, right? So um, tell us, you know, what's the, what's exciting with SecureX? And for those that haven't heard of it, I'm sure lots of people have, right? But in, in summary, Bill, you know, what is SecureX and, and why is it relevant to this conversation? So SecureX is not, not just an XDR. People often will think of it first as an XDR class of capability for being able to correlate events across the Cisco Secure product line at the endpoint in the network. Uh, and... It is also with tool, tooling and, and uh, uh, playbooks that allow an IT operations group, a NetOps group, and a SecOps groups to all be on the same page uh, with ticketing, which is uh, uh, harmonized across the organization. 
Uh, it is uh, really our, our nerve center for everything that we are doing for um, rapid threat uh, identification and containment. We have in the newest 7.0 release of our firewall threat defense software, a couple of a couple of really exciting new capabilities that take this integration with SecureX further, faster, and deeper. One is the SecureX ribbon. So this enables an operator who's in firewall management center to uh, start doing investigations uh, that are informed by SecureX directly within the firewall management center. And then if they need to go deeper and really uh, investigate deeply, they can pivot instantly into SecureX from that ribbon. So just from a user experience perspective, uh, this is very helpful. And then we also have uh, uh, new capabilities in, in the API between SecureX and the firewall management center that allows for new playbooks. We have four new playbooks that are available now uh, that speed up operations for it for NetOps and, and uh, SecOps teams. Amazing. And Valter, I'm coming to you because I'm I'm working communications, right? I'm a storyteller and I love hearing stories. So Valter, I know you as an organization at Avid Group use SecureX. So tell us your story, your experience uh, that you have today with SecureX as well. Well, we've been using SecureX since it became uh, available last year. And it, yeah, it obviously has become my favorite security platform. The, the main thing I like about uh, SecureX, it's doing so many different things for everyone, and, and it's also doing them in the right way. It, it, it is your single pane of glass for your manager or security officer. It, it shows them the status and performance of all your integrated security products. It's a threat hunting platform. You can correlate events and intel both from inside and outside your environment. It's an orchestration platform. Um, it will let you automate workflows between different systems and products. And it's also a security collaboration tool via the ribbon interface uh, Bill mentioned, or as a browser plugin, it allows your team to collaborate on, on case books, on incidents. You can extract observables from, from any web page or web interface uh, with, a, with a single mouse click. Uh, you, you can pivot uh, right into the management console of your security products and continue your investigation. One person can start an investigation and then the, the incident will be visible to everyone from within the organization and they can join in, add their own observables to it. And you can very quickly get a complete picture of your entire environment, what's happening, where it's happening, and well, with the orchestration, how to stop it from uh, spreading any further. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Great to hear about it, I can tell. Um, and obviously, you know, you talked on the, the technology side about SecureX, but also what I love is hearing the human side of it, right? How it's enabling team collaboration um, and ultimately helping people to, to get the job done in your team as well. Um, so, Bill, let's talk a little bit around Snort. So I know Snort 3 was recently released in January of this last year. So talk to us about how Snort 3 design has improved from Snort 2, please. We'd love to hear a bit more about that. Sure thing, Nish. Snort, Snort 3... You know, when we started our conversation, we we're talking about challenges that customers have with with visibility and yeah. um, Snort 3 is where you can decrypt and do deep packet inspection. Snort 3 has a number of advantages. Um, what, probably the, the most compelling advantage is that you can run more rules simultaneously with no impact on network performance. So we're we're seeing uh, on all of the existing platforms. So this is something that existing firewall customers can take advantage of today that uh, we have with our 7.0 release uh, up to 30% improvement in throughput uh, on the majority of our firewall platforms. So you can run more rules with Snort 3 and have more coverage, greater visibility into potential threats in your organization without slowing down the network. Right, so that's that's a huge benefit that uh, that comes with Snort three. The other benefit uh, that we're really excited about is that it's now not only available in the firewall management center, but Snort three is available in Meraki, and it's available in our cloud delivered firewall, our uh, umbrella cloud delivered firewall. So this is leveraging the you know the most you know ubiquitous. Uh, uh, IPS engine in the world across the Cisco security platform. 
Got it. And Valter, I want to come back to you because, you know, Bill and I can chat all day and we do about this topic because we're obviously both passionate, but we'd love to hear your stories and your experiences of bringing this to life as well, right? So what's your experience being with Snort, um, Valter, in, in your organisation, Avid Group as well? Well, we use Snort packet inspection uh, both on our firewalls and within our SD1 uh, routers. It well detects and prevents malicious traffic passing through. And it, it's, a, it's a great add-on uh for us and well i really like what i'm hearing about snort 3 as well making getting more performance out of the same uh, device with a simple software upgrade is yeah something everybody uh likes of course right and and bill when you were uh talking a little bit around the introduction of this topic you mentioned um tls uh 1.3 flows right so have you seen any situations um and i guess you know about to feel free to, to chip in as well maybe we'll actually come to you first where there's been customers that are processing encrypted TLS 1.3 flows in the firewall and it's breaking layer 7 policies? Absolutely. The TLS 1.3 breaks your application control, your URL security. It, it basically forces you to do full decryption, which is a very resource uh, intensive process. And also not always the way you want to go, looking at all the packets uh, in the entire flow. Yeah, and and you know, Walter, I was I was mentioning to you recently some of the capability that we've brought online again in this in this area of, of visibility. And when I first described this to you, you looked at me kind of like I had you know two or three heads, and I was from <laughs> outer space because you're like, how how can this be? This doesn't this doesn't sound right. But uh, we have a capability for being able. And this is where you're not decrypting traffic, okay? I just want to make sure that the audience is clear on this. This is where you're not decrypting traffic. We have an ability with a TLS 1.3 flow to actually process our layer seven rules, an application visibility and control rule or a URL filtering rule. And because you have uh, in more, more encrypted header in the TLS 1.3, um, you shouldn't be able to do that, right? So under the covers, we have we have a, a special way to pull back information um, that a server will give us on uh, 1.2 information that allows us to process those rules. That's something that none of our um, uh, major enterprise firewall competitors are offering, and so it's it's definitely an advantage because uh, you know as as Wouter had mentioned, this is a real pain point. For, for customers today, that they can't process rules, that's limiting their visibility further in most cases. So it's not, you know, it's not a sexy thing to demo. It's basically just one uh, button within our uh, management interface where you turn that capability on. But um, it's it's definitely a lifesaver in many cases where where people have a compliance uh, uh, need to be able to maintain the rules that they've already built regardless of uh, whether they're they're on a TLS 1.3 connection or not. So that that uh, is is you know definitely uh, uh, for us one of one of one of our key differentiators that that um, uh, people are very excited about. For sure. And one of the key themes and obviously one of the three challenges you know from our social media poll that came up as well was around integration, right? So, um, Bill, we've talked about integration with Secure Firewall and with, you know, Secure Workload as well. Tell us a little bit around how Hyperflex come in, comes into the picture when it comes to Secure Firewall and um, Hyperflex working together. Sure thing. We we have, uh, and I'm letting the cat a little bit out of the bag because later this afternoon <laughs> we're making an official announcement about this, but we have <laughs> with our Hyperflex, Cisco Hyperflex Hyperconverged Infrastructure Solution, uh, and this is also true with Nutanix, which is another leading uh, HCI solution. We are offering support with our virtualized uh, next-gen firewall, our fire, firewall threat defense virtual uh, firewall, that support uh, in these hyper-converged infrastructure environments. And uh, Walter, uh, I know a lot, of, uh, a lot of your experience has been with HCI and, and Hyperflex and uh, um, Nish, if you don't mind my, you know, sort of uh, ask, asking a question here as well, just curious, Walter, okay, about uh, uh, what, uh, you know, your thoughts are and, you know, where, where you, you know, see that kind of uh, control point within an HCI 
uh, environment being useful. <laughs> Oh, that's a good uh, good question. I, I didn't know about the announcement yet, so you're you're surprising me a bit here uh, <laughs> now. Um, no, sorry, I. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, I cannot think of anyone uh, anything right now. Sorry. No, 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 no problem. Yeah, yeah. This is definitely an area where we we have uh, some pent up demand for uh, you know this has been a, a, a feature request for some time to have this support both with hyperflex and nutanix uh, so it's just uh, part of part of our overall point of uh, uh, enabling a uh, inspection and control point where it's required in a customer environment for sure so um, I know we've got lots of questions coming in. So let's head on over and take some of the audience questions. Um, and I want to start with one for you, Valter, um, and I'm sure you've got some really great experience and, and um, advice to share here. So um, the question is, I'm drowning in security alerts and it's overwhelming. And so what advice do you have for me for monitoring events when I have limited resources? So I'm sure you've got some expertise and some tips to share here, Valter. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, if you're getting all these alerts all these events i mean you have your, your your software deployed and you have to console and just spewing events basically all day um there's only so much you can do with a small team um it would in my opinion be very wise to go look for somebody who can offer the service managed who can take care of those alerts for you do the initial filtering uh shift to them and only provide you with the the actionable stuff uh in there basically saying well we take care of all the first line um, support and we just give you back, well, you should check this, do this there, and, and who can also help you with the uh, with the resolution. I mean, knowing there's malware activity on, on a specific system or there's something else uh, going wrong with the workload, it's a first step, but it's not the solution. You're gonna need somebody who can talk you through it, who can help you make sense of the alerts and walk you through a safer uh, and better protected environment. Great, thank you, Valter. Um, now, I've got another question. This is always interesting to hear, you know, from security leaders in different places all around the world. So this one's obviously specific to the Europe region, Rob Valter. Um, but how are you helping companies with their GDPR regulations? Obviously, that's something that's been top of mind for a couple of years now, but it's obviously still impacting customers. So what are you hearing and how are you supporting customers uh, with GDPR? Well, one of the uh, one of the main things we can do uh, with GDPR, I mean, everybody has to uh, has to comply, of course, within the uh, in the EU, is uh, data loss prevention. We can, um, well, with email security, uh, with with umbrella, you can uh, make specific uh, policies, uh, which will help you not leaking any personal identifiable information uh, out of your uh, organization, and that's really a great connection between compliance on the one side with GDPR and a security tool which has visibility on everything going in and out of your environment uh, there. Thank you, Valter. Um, now, we've talked quite a lot, obviously, around the technology side, and I've heard some um, you know, topics and, and some areas where it's obviously, we're talking about the human side of cybersecurity, right? So we talked about misconfiguration, we talked about silo, team working. So I'd love to hear um, from both of you, actually, that maybe I'll start with you as a, a leader. You know, what, what are some of the top things in cybersecurity and, you know, specifically when it comes to network security as well, but what are some of the human observations that you're seeing, you know, when you're working with teams and what security leaders can be doing to help elevate their security practices? <sighs> Well, it, what you need, uh, well, it's automation, it's integration. Uh, you really need to move forward to a to an integrated solution, giving you full full coverage. Many companies will have different solutions in different places, and it's it's just not working for them. You you need such a big team, so many people, and there's a huge lack of cybersecurity professionals. You, you cannot have 20 different solutions and need 40 people to cover those uh, solutions. You need to have an integrated solution which you can manage with either a small team or which you can do a bit of outsourcing on it, get a, get a managed service. And that's really the only way to stay ahead of all the, uh, the malicious actors uh, out there. It, yeah, you're not going to cut it with point solutions and with a non-uniform approach and, uh, and management. 
Great, thanks, Bartra. And Bill, any behavioural, you know, human side of cybersecurity things that security leaders can be doing when it comes to this topic? Well, you know, one one thing that comes to mind is just in terms of, you know, clearly our customers, uh, they're all operating in the real world, right? And and uh, what what's top of mind for me is that, um, you know, people that are providing solutions like Cisco uh, have to be really, really mindful that, um, um, you know, for instance, um, we, you know, we can't say to customers, hey, just decrypt all your traffic as, a, as an example. If you're, if you're, if you have a visibility issue, just decrypt all your traffic because what, what the customer will come back and always tell you if you're listening is, well, we can't do that because we have, uh, certain medical information or certain, um, uh, for compliance reasons, banking information that our employees are accessing on our network, we 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 must allow them to do this. Uh, employee retention, if nothing else, this this is critical. But legally, we cannot uh, inspect that traffic, right? So there's there's this balancing uh, effort that has to has to occur. There needs to be visibility. Uh, uh, as deep as you can go, where you can do it, and where where you can afford to do it from from a from a network performance perspective, and also from an operational perspective, right? Because because uh, as Wilder has mentioned, uh, the you know the human element of this, um, the the resources are not infinite, right? Uh, um, uh, everybody has to pick and choose their battles, and and do it intelligently. For sure, thanks, Bill. Yeah. Um, so, Valter, another, another one for you, right, is around um, an organization that is uh, about to get back to partial in-office work. Um, and I know, Bill, you know, Cisco's done a lot of work around secure remote work and hybrid work now as well. So, Valter, what have you seen from your customers that are in the same situation? And what's top of mind when it comes to this topic of, you know, hybrid secure work? Well, what the big thing we learned, I think, with the pandemic is that you ha have to have your security where your endpoints uh, are. I mean, the endpoints, is gonna be, that's going to be the place where you have the interaction, the human element, that the people will click on things, they will get the emails, they will go to their uh, their websites, and that's where, well, I'm not going to say mistakes are made, but where bad things can easily happen. Um, with everybody leaving the office uh, over a year ago, you saw that many solutions would only protect uh, the user if they were in the office. And now they were being allowed back into the office. We're still seeing, I think it was uh, about 50-50% of people preferring to stay at home, preferring to be in the office. So remote workers is going to be more than, uh, than ever still. So you need to have a security solution which also protects those remote workers. You have to have proper endpoint protection in place, but also well, like Umbrella, you need to have DNS inspection, which, which not only works in the office, but will also protect the user if he's at home, on the road, on holiday, wherever. So make sure that your security is where your users are and is where, well, documents are opened, emails are viewed, websites are opened. That's the place where you want to be, where the, the first, first attack surface, the first place something nasty is going to happen. You want to have something in place there and it has to be able to immediately, well, shoot an alert back to you, um, well, if possible, automate, automatically respond, isolate the endpoint, that kind of stuff. Automation and, well, security everywhere where your users are. Thank you, Valtra. And Bill, anything to add, to add from your side? I know, obviously, you know, hybrid work. We just had our WebEx event yesterday, um, and obviously security is a huge part of that. So any comments or anything you'd like to add? The, the only thing that, that comes to mind for me, Nish, is that, uh, you know, customers are clearly going to um, uh, to Wouter and, and, and saying, hey, we, you know, and, and organizations like his and saying, hey, we, we need help. Right. Um, this is this is uh, the level of complexity is is more than we want to deal with. We want to be able to focus our IT organization in some other areas in many cases and have them be able to operate more strategically. And uh, so one thing that that uh, with our 7.0 release that we've announced is something called Cisco uh, Secure Managed Remote Access. So this secure managed remote access is enabling the IT organization, whoever's responsible for remote, remote access to offload more of their remote access VPN needs. 
And uh, that's, uh, that's something that uh, we've seen a lot of interest in. This is um, today available both uh, in North America and in Europe uh, with uh, support for that in different, different data centers in those regions. Got it. And Phil, I know you and I were talking about remote access uh, VPN en enhancements in 7.0. So is that something different or does that build on what you just talked about? I would love for you to kind of that, share and add a bit more color. Right. That, that, that's, that's a great question because a lot of our customers are saying, hey, um, you know, I'm using ASA today for my remote access VPN. And our first our first message to customers that are doing that is, um, you know, we we continue to support ASA very strongly. We continue to invest in ASA, so you can stay with ASA if you're happy. Okay, no no issues there. But for a customer that is trying to consolidate their footprint, in some cases, for you know, I would say roughly 80 85 percent of our remote access VPN use cases that we see. We have we have so much more remote access VPN capability that's exposed in the in the threat defense, the FTD manager now that uh, in many cases, a, a customer is able to uh, really start leaning on our threat defense 7.0 as they traditionally have for ASA for their remote access VPN use cases. Great, thanks for clarifying yeah. that, Bill. Um, yeah. So I have one final question for both of you, right? And I'll come to Bill and the voucher. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it as well, but I'd love to know what you're excited about um, in the future around this topic. And I know, Bill, you know, I'm sure you're gonna talk a little bit around uh, how you're excited about our integration with Firewall and with Workload as well. So about to have a think about what you're excited about uh, when it comes to your role and security in this topic. But Bill, let's come to you first. You know, what are you most passionate and excited about over the coming weeks, months, years? around this topic sure, and what sure thing. You know, we can enable. Uh, that's a great question, Nish, because, you know, certainly, like, am I excited about firewall <laughs> and workload integration? Absolutely, right? This is solving real problems for customers and, and doing something unique that no other enterprise firewall vendor can do, okay? But even more exciting than that is simply that that integration is a proof point. When we talk about this network security vision, uh, the key tenant of being able to translate intent into action. Uh, we have this, this notion with everything we're doing for simplification that a customer should be able in a human readable language to describe really what they are intending to do. And when we're talking about applications and application environments, we know that that's occurring in a multi-cloud and hybrid context. So where we are headed is the ability for a customer to describe in natural language what they are intending to do. And then whether it's a Cisco firewall or an AWS firewall or an Azure firewall to have common policy across the estate, regardless of where these control points exist. This is something that is, I want to stress for everybody that's listening, something which is part of our vision, something that is that is you know, not an announcement today, but in terms, you know, to answer your question, Nish, about what we are really, really passionate about and exciting about, this is security for the real world that is, that is really differentiated in its approach. And um, uh, yeah, we're, we're just totally jazzed about that. So I can sense your, your yeah, passion, yeah. your energy, Bill. <laughs> Thank you. It's yeah. great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And Valter, how about you? What are you, you know, particularly excited about for the future and for Avid Group as well? Well, what I'm excited about, well, specifically for Avid Group, growing our um, managed uh, security service provider proposition, uh, enabling our customers to focus on their core business, let us worry about the security, being up to date, having somebody look at the alerts and only giving you the, well, the things you really should look about. Um, cybersecurity in general, I'm really itching to make it uh, a fair fight between defenders and, and bad actors. Um, yeah. and, and I think with the right tools, uh, we, can, we can make it a fair fight. We can reduce the dwelling time between somebody intruding on your network and you finding out. Um, with automated malware analysis, uh, you can find zero days. You, you have a chance against supply chain attacks, and that's really... I hope within the next few years, also looking at well, what happened with the uh, 
with ransomware attacks uh, recently, really high profile cases that we're able to make it a more fair fight, not just defenders being attacked from all sides, being overwhelmed, unable to respond properly to have bad actors inside their environment for weeks or sometimes even months before they notice. And I really, yeah, really looking forward to making it a more fair fight to be able to uh, to defend your networks and not having to to worry every time your phone blinks in the night that something uh, something bad is happening. You know, that's one of my favorite things about being in the cybersecurity industry, uh, Valter, is a lot of people share that same sentiment, right? You're you're out to fight the good fight um, and to save, you know, and protect from those bad actors. So thank you for all you're doing and uh, really interesting to hear your insights. Um, I know we're about to run out of time now, so I just want to take this opportunity to thank Valter Hendricks and Bill Maven. Thank you for... Um, you know, Valter from joining from Avid Group and uh, Bill from obviously from Cisco. And I just want to encourage everyone that's joining and listening here, here today as well. If you want to learn a bit more around this topic, uh, we have quite a few resources out there. You'll see them on the screen. You can take a look in comments. Um, and particularly, I want to point you to the blog that we have just released on redefining network security. So like I said, you know, check that link out. It's on the screen. It's also in the comments. And there you'll also find lots of additional resources that you can take your time, take a look through. And then, of course, remember, you can reach out to anyone here at Cisco as well um, if you'd like to learn a bit more. So thank you, Valter. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone here for joining us uh, for the Cisco Chat Live. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon next time. Thank you and take care.